hub, and spoke. Audio Collective. When we went south, the Jewish community was a tiny community. Florida did not have 650,000 Jews as it has today. The Jewish community in the South was a very terrified community. That's Cy Dresner. He brought rabbis from the North to St. Augustine. In June 1964, they marched with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in protest of the city's segregation laws. Like many Jewish activists coming to the South, They were outsiders, not locals. Most of them thought that those of us who were active in the civil rights movement were causing them problems. And I understand that, by the way. I'm I'm not holding this against the few Jews who lived in the South in those days and who were outnumbered 200, 300 to one kind of thing. So how did the Jews who lived in St. Augustine feel about these outsider rabbis being in their city? For episode six of The Rabbis Go South, we went to find out. I'm Gerald Perry. And I'm Amy Geller. This is Among the Jews of St. Augustine. Simone Browdy Kilborn was the first person to answer our question about the rabbis. They went to a black church. They stayed in the black community. They did not integrate into the Jewish community, as far as I know. The Jews in St. Augustine learned of the rabbis like the rest of the country by watching their arrest on TV. Actually, there was one Jew who was told immediately of the jailing, but by the police. He was a civic and religious leader named Nathan Sonny Weinstein. In St. Augustine, we asked local rabbi Merrill Shapiro what was known about him. Sonny Weinstein was, I believe, the president of First Congregation Sons of Israel on Cordova Street at the time, had served in Tallahassee in the state legislature. And so he was the uncoronated leader of the Jewish community. Several of the rabbis report that he went to their cell at night and stood outside the bars. St. John's County Jail was somehow left in the hands of the local KKK leader, Haas Manusi. It was probably Manusi who allowed Weinstein into the jail so he could stand outside the rabbi's cell and reprimand them. Rabbis Goldstein and Setcher were eager to tell us about encountering Weinstein. You guys don't have any right to even call yourselves rabbis, he said. You guys are fostering anti-Semitism. And that's what he told us. You rabbis don't know what it's like here. You shouldn't come in from wherever you are and judge us. This is a nice town. We all get along just fine. We certainly let him have his say, but go away, Sonny. You're not going to change our minds one bit. It was audacious for Weinstein to claim that he represented the Jews of St. Augustine, as the Jewish population didn't even know the rabbis were there. But even if the Jews of St. Augustine weren't aware of the rabbis, they must have known that civil rights protests were happening in their city. We spoke with three Jews in St. Augustine with a long family history in the city, Simone Browdy Kilburn, Dulcie Freeman, and Stuart Gamzee. All had been children in 1964 when the rabbis arrived there at the invitation of Dr. King. We were surprised that one of the three, Stuart Gamzee, said he actually witnessed civil rights protests. And this is amazing. Gamsey told us he was actually standing by the swimming pool when the arrests were made at the Monson Motor Lodge. I was a wild street kid running with the rednecks, having a good time getting into mischief. That's why you see me in that picture. There's an AP photo of the integrated pool in which a plainclothes policeman is captured midair jumping onto seven of the protesters. Sure enough, two boys under age 10 appear in the upper left-hand corner of the image. They are standing on the cement lip of the patio, looking on. One of those boys must be Gamzee. I had my perch. 
I had a good viewpoint. I picked a good spot. I could see it all. And that's just what I did. I was an observer. What was my take on the thing? Well, I guess it was a pretty exciting moment. But Dulcie Freeman and Simone Browdy Kilburn, being girls, were kept at home. I was not privy to the inside information of what was going on. They're marching, they're this, they're that. I was totally sheltered in that respect. I think that Jews were not out there being rebellious. They were working on surviving, earning a living, taking care of their families. In the 1960s in St. Augustine, there were only about 50 Jewish families and one conservative shul, the Sons of Israel. According to Cy Dresner, a tiny Jewish community was what you'd expect at that time in Northern Florida. The Jewish population of the South was few and far between in those days. Only 4% of the Jews of America lived in the former slave states. There's been a shift in the population. Many Jews have moved south, especially to cities like Atlanta and Miami. And a lot more Jews settled in St. Augustine. In the year 2016, an estimate was made of 500 to 1,000. There's also Temple Bet Yam, a reform congregation, and a Chabad. Most Jews living in Florida today came from the north for the tropical weather and often to retire. But the Jews we interviewed in St. Augustine were not recent arrivals. They had roots in the South going back for generations. Their relatives had come to Florida from Eastern Europe at the turn of the 20th century, fleeing anti-Semitism. Dulcie Freeman. My great-grandparents who came from Poland, from Austria-Hungary, from Romania, from Russia, these are people that had experienced generational suppression, repression, murder, persecution. Gamsey's grandmother ended up in Florida after escaping a pogrom in her Russian village. His great-grandfather was a scientist in Russia who arrived in Florida with a secret formula for turpentine. Kilburn's grandfather was a peddler who landed at Ellis Island in 1908 before making it to St. Augustine. Freeman's great-grandfather immigrated to the U.S. from Poland and had problems with his lungs. He was told to go to St. Augustine. St. Augustine was known as a healthful community. The salubrious breezes, as they termed it, the ocean air, and it was extremely rural. And as a result, people from all over came, and they built lots of hotels, boarding houses, and other places that sick people could come to. The health of Freeman's great-grandfather greatly improved living in Florida. He helped found an Orthodox synagogue, which began construction in 1932. The grandparents of those we interviewed all found economic prosperity in St. Augustine, and it continued on with each generation. It's the story of many immigrant Jews in America. My grandparents operated a women's clothing store on St. George Street. My dad and Jack, the middle son, built the grocery store on King Street and helped my grandmother. So it was my grandmother and the two boys, essentially, that ran the business for years. My father, he was very much an entrepreneur, liquor stores, laundromats, all that kind of stuff. But even as the years went by, Jewish families remained uneasy living in the South. It carried over from their relatives fleeing pogroms and the fierce anti-Semitism of Eastern Europe. And it also came from their actual experiences living in St. Augustine. Here's Kilborn and Freeman. I always was aware that people were treating me differently, that being Jewish was not something that was popular. Judaism was an entity that was totally separate and not understood. And people 
who don't understand lots of times become hostile. There were incidents when I was a kid where I was picked up to go to school on the bus. And when kids would get off the bus, as they passed me by, they'd push me and they'd smear bubble gum in my hair. I couldn't believe this was happening. You're Jewish, and that's why. And here's Gamzee's testimony. I got beat up for being a Jew, so I could not express any sympathy, even the slightest little bit, towards black people when I was growing up. If I had it in me, I had to keep it to myself because I would be a Jew in lover. And Rabbi Merrill Shapiro. So Jews do not feel at home, and they want to feel at home. They want to be at one with the community around them, even if that community is one that lacks justice. The Jews we talked to acknowledged that their families were silent in public about racial issues. But in the business world, they had closer ties to the black community than most whites, especially within the Lincolnville African-American neighborhood. I was born in Lincolnville, South Street, in the black neighborhood. There were little enclaves of Jews amongst the blacks who lived there. That's Stuart Gamzee. A lot of the Jews here had grocery stores that serviced just in the black areas. For some reason, it was all right for us to do that because we were sort of, you know, outside of society anyway. Gail Phillips directs the Lincolnville Museum, an African-American-based history and cultural center. I think that there was a different kind of relationship with Jewish merchants as opposed to people who were white and non-Jewish. It could be because of discrimination that they had faced in the past in their history with this country as well. Amy, let's go back to when the rabbis came to St. Augustine and the question we asked earlier. Why weren't local Jews contacted about it, especially since Dr. King had such a connection with the Jewish people? Stuart Gamzee says that the Jews of St. Augustine, with only about 50 families, were reluctant to be involved with civil rights. I don't believe the Jews of St. Augustine at that time could expose themselves here without a very negative, violent reaction affecting their businesses, their children, and every aspect of their life. So here's our guess. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference decided they didn't want to put local Jews on the spot to have to take a public stand. Who would have dared to openly support the rabbis? A really scary thing to do. And probably every Jew would have been deeply paranoid about these outsiders and yarmulkes parading around their town. They would have feared an anti-Semitic backlash. Try to imagine what Jews in 1964 might have said to the rabbis if they'd actually met them. We asked St. Augustine Rabbi Merrill Shapiro. You are going to drop a bomb and set fire to our relationship with our Christian neighbors in this Christian community. And when you're done, you're going to go back to the airport and get on an airplane and fly back north. And we are going to be left to pick up the pieces. So local Jewish activism just didn't happen in St. Augustine or in other southern cities with far larger Jewish populations. But maybe southern Jews had reason to be fearful. In 1958 to 59, there were a series of bombings across the South of synagogues and Jewish centers in Miami and Nashville, and also in Northern Florida in nearby Jacksonville. In Atlanta, a courageous rabbi openly denounced segregation. In October 1958, a bombing leveled his synagogue, the Peachtree Street Temple. Luckily, no one was hurt but it was a warning for what could happen if Jews spoke up. We now live in liberal Cambridge, Massachusetts. But Jerry, you grew up Jewish in South Carolina in the 1950s. I did. My father was a biology professor at two black colleges in Columbia, Benedict College and Allen University. For me, he was a brave man to do that because for white people, his job was totally disreputable. You also attended segregated schools. That also. I did not do anything against segregation. I did not do any kind of marches. And it was only when I moved north, when I went to college, that suddenly I got involved in the civil rights movement. And I did, I guess, in the north what I was just too scared to do in the south. So I'm really not any different from the people we talked to. 
But back to the Jews who were there in 1964 in St. Augustine. As far as we can tell, the rabbis being there did not cause a backlash of any kind against the local Jewish community. Today, those we talk to are grateful to the rabbis for coming to help desegregate their town. And Simone Browdy Kilborn believes she might have joined the civil rights protests if her parents hadn't sheltered her. If I was in charge and control of my own life, I probably would have been out on the streets. These days, Simone volunteers at a food bank in a black church. Stuart Gamsey is a busker performing in the streets of St. Augustine, often singing together with a black minister. So how did the rabbis feel about the lack of Jewish support in St. Augustine? Here's Alan Setcher. I'm not condemning the whole Jewish community. I once had a Holocaust survivor who I was interviewing who said to me, one can never assume how Job should have reacted until he has lived like Job. Well, that's true for me and my attitude toward the South. In our final episode of The Rabbis Go South, we'll examine from the vantage of 60 years the impact of the rabbi's 1964 trip to St. Augustine. I never thought of myself as being courageous. I never thought of myself as being a hero. Never. We're not the heroes. The heroes are those blacks who put up with this and were there all the time. But Gail Phillips, director of the African American Lincolnville Museum, has a more positive take. I think it was important that the rabbis came because it did show solidarity, that it wasn't just something that was a black movement, it's an American movement. The Rabbis Go South is produced by Amy Geller and Gerald Perry, writing by Gerald Perry in collaboration with Amy Geller. Editing and sound design by Gary Wallach. This podcast is a presentation of the Hub and Spoke Expo. You may know Hub and Spoke as the home of thoughtful, high quality, independent podcasts like Nocturne and Rumble Strip. Now it's also a place to find limited run series like this one from independent producers. For more information, go to hubspokeaudio.org slash expo. We are supported by Lewis Black, the founder of South by Southwest, and by Joyce Saltman. Also, by Combined Jewish Philanthropies Arts and Culture Community Impact Grant and the Dr. Lawrence J. Cantor Project Completion Grant from the Southern Jewish Historical Society. Thanks to our advisors, civil rights historians Derek Gilliard in Atlanta and David Nolan in St. Augustine. I'm Amy Geller. And I'm Gerald Perry. Stay tuned for our final episode of The Rabbis Go South, Why It Matters, available next week. <laughs>